Proverbs 29, uh, may I have uh, someone read verse 18, if they would not mind. All right, thank you. Uh, your version says, uh, where there's no revelation. Uh, other versions may say vision. Where there's no vision, the people are restrained. They are cast off. In other words, if there's no vision, there's destruction, is what Solomon is trying to say. But yeah, the, vor- the word vision here is referring to a, a revelation process. Uh, this is, a, in fact, a uh, a, rev- a revelation in the sense that God has given this man a revelation, a vision. Now, I'd like for us to focus a little bit on this passage, but I want to use, I'd like for us to use the word vision in a sense that is applicable for us today. When I say vision, what comes into your mind? A dream? A picture of something? Okay. I like to elaborate on that. I like to take it from there. You know, a picture of something. All right. My question is, how do you picture yourself in the next 5, 10, or 20 years? How do you picture the congregation as a whole in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years? Vision is, in fact, an important matter that we ought to have in our life as a congregation and our life as a Christian. So for the next half hour or so um, uh, within the Bible class setting, I'd like for us to focus on the vision for the congregation and a vision for the Christian. You know, how is it that we could improve on? What are some things that we can improve on? How can we do that? Well, in order to understand of how we may improve our attitudes, our actions, or whatever it may be, we need to have a vision We need to see, foreshadow something of how it may turn out, to plan ahead, in other words. To plan ahead. Now, honestly, I mean, I don't know much information about uh, the Roy City uh, congregation, uh, but uh, I'm the full-time minister over at Magnolia Street, Church of Christ, over in Augusta, Arkansas. And I'll go ahead and share with you as an illustration uh, I've been the minister there for uh, about a year or so now. And when they asked me last September of 2012, uh, honestly, I was a little bit, uh, I'll go ahead and use the word flabbergasted. I was speechless, in other words. Uh, I don't know how they got my number. Uh, I don't know who recommended me. Obviously, somebody recommended me uh, to the congregation. So I was very humble about it, and I was very thankful uh, and speechless about the opportunity. So I went and tried out the congregation, and it's a congregation about the size of Roy City uh, now, uh, but back in September, uh, the congregation, I hate to say it, just almost died. Uh, there were no youth. Uh, they were all about at least the 12, 15 of them were elderly people, which is good, which is good. I'm not saying anything bad about it. It's good. <laughs> Put myself in a tough position when I say that. <laughs> but the thing is, who is going to be running the congregation when the, elder, when the elderly are not going to be around? Who, is, who are going to be the future participants of that congregation? Furthermore, when I researched into it, I asked them you know, some questions about the history of Magnolia Streets, the background, and so forth, how it came to be, and it was established, wow, uh, <laughs> the congregation was established in 1945, 1945, let's see, that's just about almost, let's see, 21 years after Harding was established. And in 2024, it'll be Harding's 100th anniversary. So the congregation's been around for a long, long time. And I hate 
hate for a congregation of the Lord's church to just die like that. I mean, what's going to happen? I mean, who? the building will just be there, and sooner or later the government will come and probably just tear down the building. I asked them a little bit about you know, the membership and so forth, about uh, how the membership was you know, back then, uh, how it is now, and how do you see the membership in the future, past, present, and future. So they enlightened me on some of the past memberships and experiences and so forth. And the congregation used to be up to over 80, almost 100. And it's a small building about the size, yeah, about this size. About this size. And we don't have chairs, but I mean, we have pews, though. And pews enough to uh, fit maybe a total of 50 people. So imagine 80 to 100. Uh, They probably had people standing up. It wouldn't surprise me. But over the years, especially recently, the preacher who they had before, uh, honestly, he's a, I, I know him, but I was a little bit shocked when I found out that he began to preach false teaching, false doctrine, uh, a bunch of ludicrous things, uh, and so a lot of the members left. They didn't want to deal with that teaching, which I don't blame them. But however, what I was concerned about is you know, the men there, I asked him, saying, if you knew this man was teaching, you know, a false doctrine, did you confront him about it? Yeah. Did he change his ways when he brought forth the scriptures in his eyes? No, he didn't. I was like, then why did you keep him? Fire him. Don't allow this false teacher to come in. If he is not wanting to be corrected, and if he is teaching something that is against God's word, You've got to get rid of him. What does Christ say? That false teachers are like what? Wolves disguised in sheep? How do we see the congregation now, and how will we see the congregation in the future? We have to have a vision. And over the course, honestly, and even to this day, by God's wonderful blessing and by the power of His holy word, uh, from 2012 up to 2013, we went to about 15, 18 members up to about 33, 34, 35. And that's just by God's word. God is increasing. I have been so blessed to be able to experience it. And it's wonderful. So along the lines of that illustration, the question is, do we have the concern, I mean, not worry, I'm not talking about worry. I'm talking about the concern. Concern is think is something that interests you. You begin to interest in a cause, uh, a need, or a concern or something. So no matter how big the congregation is, no matter how small a congregation is, whether if it's 50 members, uh, 500 members, or so forth, no matter what, you, the congregation, will always need to have a vision. So I'd like for us to... Again, to uh, uh, ponder on this thought for the next few minutes and discuss it a little bit. I'd like uh, for some feedback, for some participation about some things that we could do uh, that will help benefit the congregation. Something that you may see uh, that specifically Roy City may need to work on. Uh, maybe we're good in this area, but you know, maybe we're a little bit weak in this area. How can we improve it? What are your thoughts? I mean, is there any comments so far? Any you know well, questions? I mean, one thing for sure, you can never stop. Like I guess starting with uh, Matthew twenty-eight, we have the commission to go. Uh, when Christ was saying, "All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth," go therefore make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, for one, we can't stop our evangelism. Amen. Absolutely. Absolutely, evangelizing. Evangelizing out in the community. Did you have something?
Amen. I agree. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Evangelizing is, in fact, a key, one of the key factors of the church's work. You know, the church has three works. It is evangelizing, benevolence, and edification. So evangelizing is indeed part of the local congregations, or excuse me, the church, the church's work. And the local congregation has a responsibility to fulfill that, not, not only just the obligation, but in order for us to do so as well, we have to have the want to. And what is that motive for us to make us have the right attitude about going forth, proclaiming the gospel unto others? The love. Absolutely. The love. That was the first one I was looking for. Love. Paul expresses the agape love in first thirteen. Or excuse me, first thirteen. First Corinthians thirteen, I'm sorry. First Corinthians thirteen he expresses about the love. It is what? It is kind. It is patient. The list goes on. We have to have that kind of love toward the individual. We have to have that kind of love toward the precious soul that they have. Maybe there's an unsaved loved one of yours in the family. Maybe there's an unsaved loved one who you, who you have known your whole life, who you grew up with. <laughs> you know, the majority of times, conversions don't occur Unless what? Unless relationships develop. And when those relationships develop, what is it that we have to do? There has to be someone to what? Teach them. Acts chapter 8, I believe, is a great example with the Ethiopian eunuch and Philip. You know, he asked a question saying, you know, who is this prophet speaking of? Is he speaking of himself or someone else? He's reading from Isaiah chapter 53 about the sorrowing servant. And what did Philip do? He began to preach to him Jesus Christ. There are, in fact, other you know, events and stories about individuals who have been converted through their own studies. But folks, that is rare, and we should not use that as an excuse. Well, that person will figure out on himself if he just you know, reads the Word. I'm not going to say anything to him about the Gospel Self justification, <laughs> excuses that you don't that you make because you're probably just sometimes too lazy to do it yourself. It does, however, take a lot of courage to evangelize to someone. But folks, if we don't have that vision of evangelism, then we're never going to save souls. If we don't have that vision to evangelize then what's the local congregation doing? What's it's worth? I know that sounds a little bit harsh, but what's it's worth? Nothing. Evangelizing is a very significant part of fulfilling the commission that Christ gave. And it's not only just baptizing people, but after they have put on Christ in baptism. What are we called to do? Can you read Matthew 28 again? Yes, please. Uh, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to Oh, wait. Earth. Repeat that last part. In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Keep going. Teaching them. Stop. Repeat that last word. Teaching. Teaching them. them. To observe all things. To observe all things. Go ahead. That I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and then what? Teaching them. We teach, baptized, and teach. We continue to study with them. Study with the individual. 
Because why? Because they're new babes in Christ. They still have that milk until they are fully matured to what? To have the solid food. Evangelizing. A great vision to have. Any comments? Questions? Well, it's, no, it's, it's uh, you know, you teach, they're baptized, they're converted, but in Revelation, was it 2.10, that we have to be faithful unto death? There's there you go. People that would fall away after being baptized, because they haven't, I can't remember where the scripture is, but they haven't really counted the cost mm-hmm. of being a Christian. It's not, it's not an easy task. Mm-hmm. I've heard uh, one, uh, he, he wasn't a Christian or a member of the church, but I heard a preacher saying one time that it was easy to get to heaven. You have to try to get to hell. When Christ spoke the exact opposite of that, which infuriated me when I heard it, um, but you have a lot that would, uh, you know, once, once you're a uh, Christian, you know, the devil knows that, you know, your sins have been washed away. You have that opportunity to make it that much more difficult for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I think the worst thing for us as Christians that are trying to evangelize is the discouragement that comes with mm-hmm. trying to evangelize mm-hmm. and the persistency. You have to be very persistent. Mm-hmm. And you can't be bogged down in mm-hmm. the discouragement of it and then be able to be tempted to back off from it. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And that's a, that's a great point. I'd like for us to come back to that. But. Absolutely, absolutely, and I, I second that, and I agree with you on that. And I like to um, tie that together with uh, about the discouragement part that we have. Uh, it is, uh, you know, when when we've gone to you know door knocking uh, to like about ten do- you know ten houses, uh, all ten houses reject you, or you decide to do the whole neighborhood. A gospel meeting has come, and you, so you want to door knock. So you get flyers and you get door hangers and everything, and you just, wow, I mean, you go the extra mile in it. You go, you go, and you put the extra mile in it. Gospel meeting comes. You don't see any familiar faces from the houses that you evangelized at. Does that discourage us? It does. It reminds me of, reminds me of Noah. Hundred years Noah took to build the ark. And how many converts did he have over the hundred years? Zero. Well, regarding his family. I mean, regarding his family and his, you know, daughters and so forth. Uh, because God already preserved the ark, you know, for Noah and his family. But regar- I mean, regardless of Noah and his family, who else was on there? Zero. A hundred years building this ark. And I'm not, 
not quite sure if the scriptures, you know, mention about any of this, but within the hundred years, I do in fact believe that there was at least some time period of Noah who was actually warning the people and telling them about it, which he did. As we have the scriptures, when it says, what did the people respond to doing? They mocked him and laughed. A hundred years and zero converts. Imagine that. Imagine if at that time if we were able to live to be a hundred years old. And throughout our whole hundred year life, we get zero converts. How badly would that discourage us? I'd say very bad. And so discouragement comes along the lines of that. And counting the cost. Uh, There is a passage within Philippians chapter 3. Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles there. Paul here mentions about uh, counting all things that he had lost for the sake of Christ. Have somebody read verses 1 through 8. Thank you. And Paul here talks about, you know, all these qualities and all these abilities that were given to him, so forth. He says, you know, I was a Pharisee who knew the law and so forth. And he names all these things and he says, but I counted all these things lost for what? So that I may gain Christ. And I like, you know, my, at least my version, it says, for whom I suffered the loss of all things. And Paul said that when he decided to reject these things and count these things lost, it suffered. I mean, he suffered on that. It was hard. It was hard for him. But he goes on to say, I suffered the loss of all things, and do count them, but refuse. So that what? So that I may gain Christ Jesus. So when we tie into connection with about counting everything that we have lost in order to gain Jesus Christ, you know, when we live in the world, we may have all these wonderful things in the world, you may have all these wonderful, wonderful possessions in the world, but if I don't count these things lost for the sake of Christ, then I will not gain Christ. So I decide to refuse all these things so that what? So that I may gain Christ. Now, as Christians, when we count the cost, are we called to what? To count all things lost? Oh, absolutely. There's a lot of sacrifices that we have to make as Christians. You know, what if, we, what if we have this job that pays a monolithic amount of money, meaning a very high payment? But the boss says, I need you to work on Sundays. On the, and you know that's the Lord's day. <coughs> and he says, and if you can't work on Sundays, then get out of here. I like to tie this in with a new babe in Christ. There's a friend of mine who I converted back in summer 2012, and he was a new babe in Christ. And I strive to continue to study with him, but that was also the same time when I had to leave for Harding. 
So I talk with my congregation. This is when a vision comes into play. I said, I have a vision for you to please continue with my friend here who just recently was converted. They didn't uphold to the vision. They didn't uphold it. And what happened? He fell away. Now, I'm not shifting the blame on my entire congregation because when one falls away, we can't be pointing the fingers and blaming at each other. We are all guilty of it. I was guilty for not striving harder or going the extra mile with them. My congregation was guilty because they were too lazy to do it. And also my friend was guilty. Why? Because he didn't count the cost of being a Christian. And that is a part of a vision, not just for a congregation, but for each of us individually. You know, we have to count the cost. That is a vision. If we can't count the cost, then it's going to be a very, very, very difficult journey for us. And the majority of times when we see individuals who don't count the cost, they give up on the journey. Therefore, a, vi- a vision is necessary. You got something? You about to say something? I found that verse. Mm-hmm. In Second uh, Peter, uh, verse Second Peter chapter two, verse twenty, it says, "For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in in them and overcome, uh, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning, or within." better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than have known it to turn from the holy uh, commandment delivered, delivered to them. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's good. And that's true. That is absolutely true. And when a, when a Christian errs, this is the next vision I'd like for us to talk about. And again, this involves the congregation as a whole and Christians individually. We have our individual responsibilities to do this, and we have a congregational responsibility to do this. So again, When we fall or make a mistake, it is better for us to what? To blame ourselves and to blame us all than be pointing fingers. Because when something like this happens, a lot of fingers begin to point. What is it that, uh, I can't forget, Mark Twain. Yeah, what does he say? You know, if you point a finger, you got three fingers pointing back at you. Folks, I mean, that's true. A lot of of problems will disappear if we can learn to talk to each other rather than about each other. To each other rather than about each other. So now this is the point I want us to transition at. When a Christian does err and fall away, what is our vision then? Bring them back. Bring them back. How? Absolutely. Through love, prayer, personal contact. So later over here, earlier mentioned about relationships. Build a relationship up. Encourage the individual who has fallen. Build them back up on their feet. You know, we have our calling of what we have to do. We have our vision. But then, let us try to put ourselves in the shoes of the erring Christian. He himself or she himself must have the vision of what? The willpower to do so. They must have to want to. We can't force it onto them. And oftentimes I myself need to learn that. There have been times, and I'm guilty of it, there have been times when my vision was very poor, where I basically just took the Bible and started beating them on the back of the head with it. It makes things worse. There's a time for rebuking, but there's never a time when it comes to force. You can't do anything. Admonish. There you go. Mm-hmm. 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 Absolutely. Absolutely. Admonish them first to encourage them Why is it that we meet on the first day of the week as Christians? He 
encourage each other. Hebrews 10.25, exhorting one another. That's why it's important to attend the assemblies and not forsake it. That is why a vision for, again, this may sound harsh, but all I can do is be honest and present to you the truth. But those who are weak in the faith, in other words, what I mean by that is Sunday morning seems to be enough, so I'm just not going to go Sunday night or Wednesday night. What's the reason why we have the assembly? Well, one, it is to worship God. It's for edification. But the writer of Hebrews, in chapter 10, verse 21 through 25, he says that it is the ability for us to draw closer to Christ in full assurance of our faith. We hold fast that hope that we have in him, and we build one another up in love, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves, but encouraging one another. I find that very interesting. Very, very interesting. Now, do we benefit from worship? Absolutely. And look at that. When we have a vision to better ourselves as Christians, to make us stronger, you know, people say, well, you know, just going to church isn't, you know, should not be the first thing to do. I mean, they go around and say that. You, know, you need to have that personal relationship with God. Well, yeah, you have to have that personal relationship with God. You do. You have to have that personal relationship with God. But when we say that it is necessary for us to attend the assemblies whenever there's opportunity, it's not to exclude that we should not have a personal relationship with God, because we should. That is obvious as a Christian. But when we begin to start attending, excuse me, attending the assemblies, both morning, evening, and you know, Wednesday night, and whenever there's an opportunity, you know, we can be benefited from it. We come with the attitude to both what? To say, how can I benefit the church and how will the church you know, be able to benefit me? You know, I mean, it all comes together. There's not one without the other. It all comes together. We become benefited by what? By being edified, by building up our knowledge and our love and, toward God and toward each other, to be, to be an obedient child of God when he calls us to the assemblies to worship him, according to the way that he has instructed us in his word, in the right attitude, in the right heart. Absolutely. 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 And I, I agree with you on that. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. It yeah, absolutely does. When we engage our eyes on something, you know, like you said, the focus on just this one aspect that, of what we want, you know, we, we lose everything. We lose the understanding of the right motives behind it. You know, is this for entertainment? What is this for? What's the right motive behind it? You know, I find it very interesting that... <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Apologize, my throat's really dry. <coughs> I find it um, you know, very interesting that... <laughs> find this within the congregations of the Lord's Church. When I see, I've attended a few congregations that I see that people are very sincere in the worship, they have the right attitude, they have the right motive, their vision of what they have in the heart is, oh, it's good, it is good, and they got it. They got the Spirit. But when I look at how the worship's done, I don't see the truth in it. I see congregations who are beginning to involve instrumental music. Congregations who are beginning to involve the hand clapping, all the singing, the chanting, the waving of the hands. And it's like, 
It's no longer. Absolutely. 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 Then again, I go over to some other congregations, and I see the members who have the truth. Oh, they have it. They have it. They have it down. You know, we're singing with our voices just as God has commanded us. You know, we, we're praying, and the Lord's Supper, we, you know, we're partaking of the Lord's Supper together. We have the giving and so forth. We're studying God's Word. We have everything done just as according to the pattern it is. But then I see them neglecting the Spirit. How do I know that? It's because I remember, sing, I remember we sang one song called, I Know Whom I Have Believed In. And if you look at the second verse of that song, it is an unscriptural verse. Because it says, I know not how the Spirit moves. I know not how the Spirit convicts me of sin. I looked around, and I'm like, and people were singing it. I saw people just standing there going, and I could tell they're on autopilot because they're not focusing on the words from the heart and the mind. That's an unscriptural verse. I know not how the Spirit moves. I know not how I'm, the Spirit convicts me of sin. But do we know how the Spirit moves? Do we know how the Spirit convicts us of sin? Through the Word, absolutely. Yes, we do. But everyone started to sing that. And they didn't have the understanding of the mind, of the hearts, of what the words. They weren't paying attention at all to it. Real quick, I got another illustration. A man... A man dies and he goes to heaven. And in heaven he meets an angel and he says to the angel, I want to see my congregation one last time, my home congregation one last time. May I please just have that opportunity to see that congregation one last time? The angel says, sure. So the angel takes him to the morning service on the Lord's Day. And he saw only 25 members. And he's bewildered. He says, what in the world? You know, we, we were a 300-member congregation. What in the world happened? The angel looked at him and said, from up here, we see those who are truly worshiping. We only see those who are truly worshiping. You know, even back in the Old Testament, God, from Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses uh, 26, 27, and 28, you will read that at that time, God himself even wanted to be worshipped from the heart. If you read that passage carefully, you'll, you'll see that God says, Oh, I see what the things that they're doing are right. You have got it. You have nailed it. But, oh, I wish that they had a heart for me in that. Christ says, worship in what? Spirit and in truth. You can't have one without the other. So when we have a vision as the congregation as a whole, that is why it is wise for the congregation to have a vision of who they believe are qualified as the elders. Do the elders meet the qualifications, the truth, and do the elders have the desire to want to be the elder? Desire comes from where? It comes from here. When we worship, do we want to worship in spirit and in truth? When we have the vision as a congregation, are we going to focus on both the spirit and both the truth? Or are we focusing too much on the truth where it becomes vain worship when our hearts are not in it? Matthew 15, 9. Or do we focus a little bit too much on the right motive? You know, we're sincere about it, but we neglect the truth. Colossians chapter 2, will worship, worshiping in our own way. We may have the right attitude, but we worship in our own way. Scriptures condemn that as well. For vision of a congregation, when it comes to worship, spirit and in truth is the key. We talked about evangelizing. We talked about the worship. And for these next last few moments that we have, I'm not sure, when does class usually end?
<laughs> preach on. <laughs> well, I mean, this is Bible class. I want everyone's input, so I don't want to be uh, uh, too preachy on it. Oh, 11.15? Okay. It's what? You started at till. Okay, so it was actually because I went over my preaching. I do that all the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Amen. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. Edification, benevolence. Absolutely. Amen. That's absolutely. And I also like to real quick stress this one point. And again, this involves us both as a congregation and as a Christian individually. When it comes to I'd say both putting together evangelizing and benevolence. A lot of this overall involves us of getting out of our comfort zones, does it not? There are times when we have got to get out of our comfort zones, and that's hard. It is. I'll admit it. I like for us all to admit it. That is hard. But what I also see in Christ's ministry. It's not the only thing, but it's another thing that I see in Christ's ministry, especially in Luke's gospel, is that when he actually ministered, when it came to evangelizing in his ministry, when it came to helping others, benevolence, and when it came to him teaching others, edification, oh, look at all that. He's got all three. Before the church was established, he had all three. Woo. But when it came to benevolence and evangelizing and so forth, of how he saw it in his gospel is that he got out of his comfort zones when he came down from heaven. As Paul says, he lowered himself, first, uh, excuse me, uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 uh, through 11. He emptied himself. He came into the lowest form of man to humble himself. I believe that he got out of his comfort zones. His comfort zone. Of what? No, being God. He said that he counted it not equal of God to something to be grasped on. He didn't grasp onto it. But as a man, I found it very interesting that when he ministered and evangelized and did good things, he did it toward a lot of the individuals who, at least in that time, were considered unworthy. And that evolved a lot when it comes to the poor, the... um, the sick, the less fortunate. 
Now, there are a lot of less fortunate people in here. And those who don't even have the gospel truth may be labeled as one who is less fortunate. There's a great hymn that says, uh, The gospel is for all. It is for all. Those who are poor, less fortunate. Those who are sick and dying, who don't have the bread of life, who don't have the water of life. So what are we going to do? Now, this person over here has, you know, a, uh, a, a terrible flesh-eating bacteria. And he's about to die. And you know that they're not saved. Oh, but, you know, this, over, this guy over here, you know, he doesn't have any kind of disease, you know, like that. So I'm just going to go over here and, hey, how you doing? That's not what Christ did. I, what Christ would have done? Maybe this man over here that you're talking to is not saved, which is good. But what would Christ have done? He would have gone to both, I believe. To that person and to that person. Ma'am? He's no respecter of persons. Amen. I agree. So a lot of it has to get out of our comfort zones. You know, maybe... You know, there are so many opportunities out there that I believe the congregation takes for granted. That they simply pass on by. You know, man, a man's car is broken on the side. You know, he and his family, his wife, maybe he, maybe he might be by himself. Now, is it wise that you be prepared when it comes to, you know, knowing who this man is? You know, because you don't want to be at, say, uh, unwise about the situation uh, just simply you know just like going straight up there because I mean the man could just his plan behind it may be to try to kidnap somebody so it is to be prepared and this involves a vision oh is it? yes it does it involves a vision but would you be willing to park your side park your car right on the side to ask him if he needs any assistance Maybe he needs help changing the tire. What a great way for you to help him change the tire and also be able to introduce him to the gospel. There are so many opportunities that we just simply take for granted, that I take for granted as well. What is our vision as a congregation? It involves getting out of our comfort zones. It involves evangelizing, planning out of what we want to do planning out if we want to, you know, go door knocking and so forth. It involves, you know, the benevolence that we talked about. It involves, you know, the worship. How is our worship going to be? Hopefully your vision will say that it has to be in accordance to the scriptures, both spirit and in truth, not one without the other. Will our vision help us to keep out of the ditches on the left and on the right and stay on what God says, the straight and narrow path of his word? This is where I want to be found at. And we are guilty of sometimes falling over this side and falling over this side. But what is our vision? If our vision doesn't work, as the young lady just mentioned over there, we need to step back and be able to think and to communicate and say, okay, well, this isn't working. How will it work? How can I go about sharing the gospel without it being... Uh, without having to do something uh, uh, it's not that that's against the scriptures you know Paul says that he counted all things lost and what did he do in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 he says oh yeah I, uh, I became a Jew so that I might win Jews I became poor so that I might win a poor he took it to the extreme that is extreme why because his overall point was to what save souls that is what he wanted to do. He wanted to save souls. That was the, the whole point of his vision, is to save souls. You know, this is a broad topic. This is why I love being able to speak about, you know, the vision for a congregation and the vision for the Christian individual because, I mean, it's a broad topic. It is a very broad topic. 
And in the specific context here, you know, we need to ask, what is the vision for Roy City Church of Christ, and what is my own personal vision as a Christian in the congregation of Roy City Church of Christ? How is it, and what is it? What are we going to do? Again, we could go on, but I don't want to... <laughs> you know, there's some good food over there, and I don't want the food to get cold. By the time we get back there, the fried chicken's cold, and everyone's going to start stoning the preacher. <laughs> but uh, appreciate everybody's uh, participation. And again, I really wish that we could uh, keep going on. There's so many good things to say about having a vision. But again, this is serious. Uh, something for each and every one of us to consider. What is our vision as a congregation, and what is our vision as a Christian? Are there any last-minute uh, comments or questions anybody has? <laughs> well, you all participated very well. Thank you for your feedback, your input, and in uh, uh, the discussion. I really do appreciate it. And I guess we will dismiss the class.